Hello, happy uh, April 15th. It's tax day. Happy tax day to you all. I'm sure that's super exciting. Of course, uh, the IRS has found it within themselves to be generous during this time of uh, pandemic and uh, put off all of our uh, their expectations for receiving our uh, public funds. So uh, good on them. Good for us. I'm going to keep reading the, the last chapter of our little book. Uh, the chapter is called A Framework of Knowing. Then I'll finish up with uh, the Easter song, Now All the Vault of Heaven Resounds. In a sense, I rather hope that this chapter might be unnecessary, for much of what I'll be doing is trying to draw out what I hope has become apparent from the previous chapters with relation to knowing Jesus, and just focusing it a little. What I hope I have conveyed is how the crucified and risen Jesus made himself known to his disciples and consequently through their witness to us. Let me try and work back, therefore, from where I ended in the last chapter to where I started in the first, looking at each dimension which the risen Lord makes present and alive, so as to see how each one will bring us a little closer to knowing Jesus. We ended with the presence of the universal victim as a foundation for the new unity of humanity. I think, therefore, that one of the first questions we can ask ourselves about whether or not we know Jesus is, to what extent are we caught up in a sectarian frame of mind? To what extent are our responses tribal? Let me suggest, let me suggest ways in which we might be. Whenever we behave as though some group to which we belong is self-evidently superior to, more truth-bearing than some other group. That is to say, whenever there is a note of comparison in our reactions and behavior, the comparison can be to our favor, as when we consider ourselves superior, or to our detriment, as when we take on the role of the oppressed victim of society, or whatever. Both of these comparative forms of behavior betray what we have not, that we have not found the givenness of the self-giving victim as a foundation of our unity. So, for instance, Catholics may easily talk of Protestants or Muslims as though the Catholic Church were superior to these other groups. Thus, belonging to the Catholic Church makes of one a superior sort of person. After all, one knows the truths of the faith and belongs to the true Church. This attitude is not uncommon, and it gives a sort of feeling of combative brotherhood with fellow other, other fellow Catholics, a strength and sense of belonging as one faces up to a world run by hideous armies of Protestants pagans, masons, or what have you. In some countries, the word Jew would traditionally be part of this list of others. Well, I hope that gives it away. The unity that is created in this way, even the laughing emotional bonding that seems to have no practical consequences, is created at the expense of a victim or victims, at the expense of an exclusion. That is to say, it is a unity that is derived over against some other. And that is to betray the very deepest truth of the Catholic faith, the universal faith, which by its very nature has no over against. The unity which is given by and in the risen victim is purely given. It is indicative of no superiority at all over anyone else. Anyone who genuinely knows the crucified and risen victim can never again belong wholeheartedly to any other social or cultural or religious group. He or she will always belong critically to all other groups, because all other groups derive their unity over against someone or some other group. The only unity to which he or she cannot escape belonging is the new humanity that the Holy Spirit creates out of the risen victim, the unity which subverts all other unities. And this new unity given us in the Catholic Church is not yet a realized unity, as must be apparent. The Church does not teach that it is the kingdom of heaven, which is the realization of the unity in the new Israel, but that it is the universal sacrament of that kingdom. That is to say, that it is the efficacious sign of a reality that has been realized only in embryo. As such, it is radically subversive of all other forms of belonging, all other ways of constructing unity. But it is so as a gift from God. So knowing Jesus implies of necessity a gradual setting free from any tribal sense of belonging and the difficult passage into a sense of belonging that is purely given. Its only security is the gratuity of the giver 
and that means a belonging in a group that has no abiding city, that unlike the fox has no hole and unlike the bird has no nest. You can see, I think, why it is particularly sad when Catholics turn belonging to the church into a sectarian belonging, into a definable cultural group with a clearly marked inside and outside and firm ideas as to who belongs outside. Of such people can be said that they do not go into the kingdom of heaven and throw away the key so that others may not enter it. By their very sectarian insistence on the unique truth of Catholicism, or might we say Lutheranism, these people cut themselves off from access to the truth which they think is theirs, but which is only true when it is received as given. The flip side of this sign of knowing or not knowing Jesus is the adoption of the role of victim, one of the key moves in modern society if you want to establish your credentials and make space so as to be tolerated. I imagine that almost all of us at one time or the other have felt the pull of this cultural imperative. If we can cast ourselves as victims, then this makes us pure and innocent. Society is the villain. This is a tactic for any number of so-called minority groups in society and for any number of individuals in the relationships. And I would add, as an aside, that I think that's actually the strategy that many in the majority society take, which is to cast themselves as the victim uh, when their privilege and power is threatened. It is a way, too, of covering up my violence, or the violence of the minority group, by blaming the usually nebulous other for all my ills. It can thus be a potent form of emotional blackmail, as well as making it very difficult to distinguish cases where people really are being persecuted, and, sometime, and something must be done about it, from cases where people are using their sacred status as victims to get away with what no other person or group would be able to. I'm sure that all of you can think of examples of this mechanism in operation from your own history. Now again, the knowledge of Jesus, the crucified and risen victim, makes a difference here. For if you know the crucified and risen victim, you know that you are not yourself the victim. The danger is much more that you are either actively or by omission or both a victimizer. We only have one self-giving victim whose self-giving was quite outside any contamination of human violence or exploitation. The rest of us are all involved with that violence. The person who thinks of him or herself as a victim is quick to divide the world into we and they. In the knowledge of the risen victim, there is only a we, because we no longer need to define ourselves over against anyone at all. So knowing the universal victim involves a conversion in these very deep areas of our belonging and our ways of relating. Any talk of knowing Jesus that permits the sectarian attitude, the we and they, might well give cause for suspicion. You can see once again how the theme of the universality of the victim and hence of the church and the theme of justification by faith are the same theme in the light of this. But the whole point of justification by faith is that it is justification by God, not self-justification. The whole problem Luther had with works was that he took the Catholic insistence on good works to be necessarily a source of self-justification. Self-justification is, of course, when I justify myself over against someone or something else. I am trapped in a defensive or self-justifying position if I constantly depend on comparison with or approval from others. That means that my sense of identity, my security is built over against others and is not simply gratuitously given. I am dependent on various ways of showing that I am different, separate, not part of the crude mass of humanity. Self-justification and the sectarian attitude are exactly the same phenomenon the givenness of goodness by God, implying the growing appreciation of my similarity to and my lovability as one of the crude mass of humanity which is loved by God. The givenness of justification and the givenness of the universality, the Catholicity of salvation, are one and the same phenomenon. In this way, the individual and the group simultaneously learn to live without any over-against defining themselves against no one at all. That is a sure sign of the real knowledge of Jesus. Still abounds Christ 
has triumphed, he is living. Sing choirs of angels loud and clear. Repeat their song of glory here. Christ has triumphed, he is living. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Eternal is the gift he brings, therefore our heart with rapture sings. Christ has triumphed, he is living. Now still he comes to give us life, and by his presence stills all strife. Christ has triumphed, he is living. Lord, with dauntless love, set heart and will on things above, that we conquer through your triumph. Grant grace sufficient for life's day, that by our lives we truly say, Christ has triumphed, he is living. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Peace to you.